The Solitudes of Nature and of Man, or The Loneliness of Human Life, by William Roundsville Alger, 1867. Part 1. The Solitudes of Nature At the first glance, every form of being appears to be social, all the world gregarious. The trees interlace their branches and wave their tops in multitudinous union. From the equator to the poles, the waves shoulder their fellows, glistening with innumerable smiles. Whole orchards of apple blossoms blush in correspondence. In regiments, the ranks of corn laugh on the slopes. Ponds of lilies uncover their bosoms to the moon. Meadows of grass blades bend before the breeze, and the barley rustles millions of beards together on the lee. Shoals of herring solidify acres of the sea with moving life. Infinitudes of phosphorescent organisms covering the surface of the deep turn its heaving field of darkness into a sheet of fire. There are ant hills, animated cities whose inhabitants outnumber Jeddo and Pekin. Villages of beavers build in company. Shaggy hosts of bisons shake the globe with the dull thunder of their tread. Herds of antelopes are seen crowding the entire horizon with their graceful forms. The naturalist in the tropics sometimes beholds clouds of gorgeous butterflies, miles in width, flying past him overhead all day. Audubon, while crossing the Kentucky Barrens in 1813, journeyed for three days beneath a flock of passenger pigeons, which, according to his careful estimate, formed an oblong square a mile in breadth and 180 miles in length, and included more than a billion birds. Moving firmaments of locusts hide the heaven and darken the earth. And what mathematics will compute the sum of the insects that toil in the erection of a coral reef? Everywhere, then, we see nature collecting her products. Sands on the shore, leaves in the wood, fields of flowers, aggregations of mountains, firmaments of stars, swarms of insects, flocks of birds, herds of beasts, crowds of persons. Life with us seemed to be attractive, the enemy of isolation, huddling its subjects into social closeness from heaps of mites to tribes of men. But after all, these phenomena are exceptional and the inferences delusive. There is more loneliness in life than there is communion. The solitudes of the world outmeasure its societies. If consciousness sometimes draws, it has its pole of repulsion as well, and much of that which looks like fellowship is really but an amassment of separations. What sociality is there in compact leagues of animalculae? Each one, shut in his incommunicative cell, might as well have the solar system to himself. The higher we look on the scale of strength and individuality, the more isolated we see that the nature and habits of creatures are. The eagle chooses his eyrie in the bleakest solitude. The condor affects the deserted empyrean. The leopard prowls through the jungle by himself. The lion has a lonely lair. So with men. While savages like the Hottentots gibber in their kraals, and among civilized nations, the dissipated and the frivolous collect in clubs and assemblies, dreading to be left in seclusion, the poet loves his solitary walk, the saint retreats to be closeted with God, and the philosopher wraps himself in immensity. The Solitudes of Man Physical Solitude and Spiritual Loneliness After every description of the monotonous wastes and wilds of outward nature, we receive a heightened impression of what true lonesomeness is by turning to the intenser inner deserts of mental and moral being. 
The physical solitudes of nature are without any feeling of their own incommunicable separation and dreariness. But the spiritual solitudes of man are conscious and either pine under the burden of isolation or groan for relief. The sea, as its murmuring lip caresses the shore, or its mountainous surges shatter against the cliff, seems not to feel lonely, is company enough for itself, until deserted, yearning man approaches to give it contrast and interpretation. When shipwrecked man lies tossed on the strand, thoughts and fears of home, love, death, eternity, thundering at the base of reason, then first the sympathizing phenomena without form a scene of genuine solitude, and loneliness becomes an experience of anguish. Obviously, there can be no external expanse so deserted, so sublime, as that night scene of the soul when it muses alone with faith and wonder, overhung by a still immensity of starry thoughts. Physical solitude and spiritual loneliness suggest, but do not imply, each other. Either may blend with the other to heighten it, or to relieve it. Either may include or exclude the other. On a morning of May long ago, a young man rode across an Illinois prairie with a friend. They passed on the boundless expanse, far out of sight of any human habitation, thousands of crab apple trees in full blossom, their beauty and fragrance surpassing all that he had ever dreamed of vegetable loveliness and perfume. It seemed as if the whole world had been converted into green grass, blue sky, apple blossoms, odor, golden sunrise, and two men on horseback. Yet loneliness was an impossible feeling. Every capacity of the soul was crowded by the complex and strange exhilaration of that hour. Compare with such a scene and experience those presented by a convict undergoing execution in front of a hundred thousand spectators. While the officer adjusts the cap and robe, the most awful interests of man are brought to bear on the soul of the unhappy victim. Eternity seems condensed in the dropping moments. There is no solitude here, but how dread a loneliness. There is also often a profound loneliness, full of pain, in the upper rooms of those high houses in great cities in which the poor single occupants hearken to the almost inaudible murmur of the streets below and look up at the stars. Countless thousands of men close around each wretched garretteer, yet he as bleakly alone as though drifting on a plank in mid-ocean. To sit on rocks, to muse o'er flood and fell, to slowly trace the forest's shady scene, where things that own not man's dominion dwell, and mortal foot hath ne'er or rarely been, to climb the trackless mountain all unseen, with the wild flock that never needs a fold, alone o'er steeps and foaming falls to lean, this is not solitude, tis but to hold, converse with nature's charms, and view her stores unrolled. But midst the crowd, the hum, the shock of men, to hear, to see, to feel, and to possess, and roam along the world's tired denizen, with none who bless us, none whom we can bless. Minions of splendor shrinking from distress, none that with kindred consciousness endued, if we were not, would seem to smile the less. Of all that flattered, followed, sought, and sued, this is to be alone, this this is solitude. Epictetus, in his fine and brave little essay on solitude, gives this as his definition of it. To be friendless is solitude. The more sharply we meditate on it, the more thoroughly we test it, the more deeply to the root of the matter we shall find this word of the cheerful Phrygian Stoic to go. Zimmerman says, Solitude is that state in which the soul freely resigns itself to its own reflections. This is really no definition. It is a partial and superficial description of solitude. More strictly, it is a statement of one of the effects of being unoccupied from without. 
Obviously, solitude is the deprivation of companionship, but our own reflections are often the bestowers of a vivid companionship. The true definition is this. Solitude is the reaction of the soul without an object and without a product. If our activity has objects, those objects serve as comrades. If it's creative, the results serve as comrades. But if our activity is the overflow of unemployed powers with no object to meet and return it, with no product to embody and reflect it, we are conscious of an unrelieved loneliness. Solitude, therefore, is the reaction of the soul without an object and without a product. The Solitude of Individuality the first specification to be made of the loneliness of human life is that which results from the fatal separateness and hiddenness of each individuality. The innermost secret of the selfhood of any being can never be communicated, can never be shown to another. Only little superficial fragments of our life are revealed in comparison with the portion which moves on in unguessed concealment. That marvelous something which makes us ourselves constitutes in us an impenetrable additum where only the power that created us can be or look. Vainly strives a soul to mingle with the being of our kind. Since the deepest still is single, vainly hearts with hearts are twined. It is a well-known fact in physics that no two particles of matter ever truly touch. Their contact is but virtual. An ultimate sphere of force surrounds each atom with a repulsion absolutely invincible. Were the total universe made a press and brought to converge on two atoms, that dynamic investiture could not be broken through and an actual meeting effected. So with souls. Alas, how widely yawns the moat that girds a human soul. Each one knows its own bitterness, its own joy, its own terrors and hopes, and no foreigner can ever really touch but only more or less nearly approach and exchange signals like distant ships in a storm. Oh, the bitter thought to scan all the loneliness of man, nature by magnetic laws circle unto circle draws, but they only touch when met, never mingle strangers yet. Will it evermore be thus, spirit still impervious? Shall we never fairly stand soul to soul as hand to hand? Are the bounds eternal set to retain us, strangers yet? Every man wrestles with his fate, not in the public amphitheater, but in the profoundest secrecy. The world sees him only as he comes forth from the concealed conflict, a blooming victor or a haggard victim. We hate or pity, we strive or sleep, we laugh or bleed, we sigh and yearn, but still in impassable separation, like unvisiting isles here and there, dotting the sea of life with sounding straits between us. It is a solemn truth that in spite of his manifold intercourses, and after all his gossip is done, every man in what is most himself and in what is deepest in his spiritual relationships lives alone. So thoroughly immersed is the veritable heart behind the triple thickness of individual destiny, insulating unlikeness and suspicion that only the fewest genuine communications pass and repass. Rarely in unreserved confidence is the drawbridge lowered and the portcullis raised. Frequently the most intimate comrades of a life, when the whole tale of days is told, know little or nothing of each other. So successfully are our disguises worn, so closely are these impervious masks of sense and time and fortune fitted to the being we are. Occasionally, urged by overstress of curiosity and tenderness, taking the dearest ones we know by the hand, we gaze beseechingly into their eyes, sounding those limpid depths, if haply, reading the inmost soul, we may discern there a mysterious thought and fondness, 
answering to those so unspeakably felt in our own. But again and again we turn away at last with a long-drawn breath, sighing, alas, alas. No solicitation can woo, no power can force admission to that final inviolate sanctuary of being where the personality dwells in irreparable solitude. Were this all, however, only the fewest persons would be troubled by their isolation. There is another experience, more open to view and more oppressive to bear, that in its sharpness aches for companionship. What is it, and what are its conditions? The solitude necessarily belonging to the inmost essence, structure, and contents of every personality we accept as a law of our being and circumstances. But to have a peculiar personality is to know a special loneliness, which is a trial. Peculiarities in the degree in which they mark a soul make that soul unintelligible to others. And the more unlike a soul is to the souls around it, as a general thing, the greater desire it feels to see itself reflected in them, understood by them, sympathized with and cherished by them. Chamiso's unique tale of Peter Schlemmel, or the man without a shadow, powerfully illustrates this. Wherever poor Peter goes, his lack of a shadow insulates him in wretched singularity. Every curmudgeon, hunchback, roguish schoolboy spies out his fatal defect, and the mob pelt him with mud. He wears away days and nights in his chamber in solitary sorrow. He wanders on the heath alone with his misery, and at last betakes himself to a cave in the Thebes. It is not simply for one to be by himself that makes him feel lonely. In the quaint phrasing of Sir Thomas Brown, we must confess that they whose thoughts are in a fair and hurry within are sometimes fain to retire into company to be out of the crowd of themselves. When our noisy task is done and fellow laborers retire and outer tools and cares are dropped and leisure ushers an inner world of congenial pursuits, we may truly say we are never more completely occupied than when idle. So a man, as Scipio said of himself, is really never less solitary than when physically alone, if his solitude be filled with spiritual presences that give employment to his mind, keep the currents of consciousness flowing. Who contemplates, aspires, or dreams is not alone. He peoples with rich thoughts the spot. The only loneliness, how dark and blind, is that where fancy cannot dupe the mind. Where the heart, sick, despondent, tired with all, looks joyless round and sees the dungeon wall. So long as the fluent and refluent tides of thought and feeling freely rise and fall, we need not companions to make us happy. When that condition fails, no society can prevent the painful longings of our lonesomeness. The fruition of a blessed communion is, in essence, simply a harmonized action and reaction of the soul and what surrounds it. Be this realized, and there is fellowship everywhere. Silence is melodious, and desertion itself social. Then, out of the tender exuberance of his heart, one may exclaim, There is a pleasure in the pathless woods, there is a rapture on the lonely shore, there is society where none intrudes, by the deep sea and music in its roar. I love not man the less, but nature more. From these are interviews in which I steal, from all I may be or have been before, to mingle with the universe and feel what I can never express yet cannot all conceal. True desertedness and its pains are experienced when we want the appropriate nutriment and stimulus for our faculties and affections, fit dischargers and outlets for their fullness. It is to miss loved objects, the wanted excitants and channels of our souls, and to have no sufficing new ones in their stead, and to feel that none of the people around understand us and feel with us. The exiled Switzer pines in a foreign clime for his native mountains, the sublime prospect, the familiar legendary spots, 
the upland breeze, the stimulant variety, the boundless freedom. And as he remembers, he weeps till his heart breaks. The soul, too, has its own deeper homesickness, an unappropriated enthusiasm, a full heart aching for a vent and a return and finding none, a spirit thwarted of its proper action and reaction. This is the painful essence of solitude, the live vacuum of lonesomeness. Not the mere presence of numbers can heal this spiritual pain. There is no solitude in the world so heavy as that of a great city to the sensitive stranger who stands in its streets and sees the endless tides drift by till he turns away, feeling of all these multitudes hurrying past, not one, not one cares anything for me. Appropriate objects of thought and affection, if present in imagination, may furnish satisfying employment for the activities of the soul however far they are removed, in fact. The wild bird whose little heart throbs instinctively towards her nest and broadlets is happy, as, all alone, she cuts the desert air towards home with a worm in her mouth. Galileo, gazing at the constellations through the grating of his cell, and feeling the fellowship of the illustrious conquerors of science in all ages, was less alone than when he knelt amid the scowling throng of inquisitors to retract the truth. Not visible approximation, but conscious affinity is the chief condition of intercommunication. What good is it that prison wards are in juxtaposition and that the stars are thick? As well for each other not to exist as to exist hopelessly, sundered from knowledge and sympathy. The king and the footman may consort as the lion and the jackal, but bodily presence is not friendship. Exchange of command and obsequiousness between superior and inferior is not the satisfaction of the natures of both in common communion. Unlike souls, though crowded together in ranks, may all the while be as lonely as the rows of funeral urns in a columbarium. John Foster writes in his journal, relapsed into the solitaire feeling of being a monad, a self-originating sad and retiring sentiment, which seems to say, no heart will receive me, no heart needs me. Again, he writes in the same journal, feel this insuperable individuality. Something seems to say, come away. I am but a gloomy ghost among the living and the happy. There is no need of me. I shall never be loved as I wish to be loved, and as I could love. I will converse with my friends in solitude, then they seem to be within my soul. When I am with them, they seem to be without it. The gravedigger, wholly by himself, shoveling up the skull of poor Yorick, was in a jovial entertainment of merry thoughts. Hamlet, isolated by his sad endowments, shaking his disposition with thoughts beyond the reaches of his soul, moved about in the busy press of ladies and courtiers, appallingly alone. To a great nature, deeply in earnest, frivolous and shallow company makes desertion twice desolate, as certain sounds serve but to make stillness seem doubly still. The tenacious tenets of holy moods and mighty tasks have little in common with the fugitive hovers who flutter in and out of every wind that rises. Any exceptional deprivation, gift, or experience, either in kind or degree, in proportion to its distinctive intensity, separates, emphasizes its subject with solitariness. The loss of any sense by man, as that of hearing, lifts a sad dark barrier between him and his fellows. The solitude of blindness is preeminently deep and oppressive, and it is pathetic to think how many great men have, like Homer and Milton, had the windows of their souls thus closed. Galileo, in his 73rd year, wrote to one of his correspondents, Alas, your dear friend has become irreparably blind. These heavens, this earth, this universe, which by wonderful observation I had enlarged a thousand times beyond the belief of past ages, are henceforth shrunk into the narrow space 
which I myself occupy. So it pleases God, it shall therefore please me also. Handel passed the last seven years of his life in total blindness, in the gloom of the porch of death. How he and the spectators must have felt when the great composer in 1753 stood pale and tremulous with his sightless eyeballs turned towards a tearful concourse of people while his sad song from Samson, Total Eclipse, No Sun, No Moon, was delivered. Nothing could be more lonely than the chief characters in literary fiction. With exceptional endowments, aims, and achievements, such as Prometheus, Faust, St. Leon, Zanoni, Hawthorne has expressed a kindred thought with his usual vigorous felicity. The perception of an infinite shivering solitude amid which we cannot come close enough to human beings to be warmed by them, and where they turn to cold, chilly shapes of mist, is one of the most forlorn results of any accident, misfortune, crime, or peculiarity of character that puts an individual ajar with the world. Hawthorne was himself a lonely man, afflicted with a morbid shyness. He had a preternatural insight into the secrets, especially the pathological secrets of human nature. That high idea of himself, intensely emotional, which with his genius he could not fail to have, was associated with a feeling of inability to impress it properly and see it reflected in others. In such an example, Extreme shyness, with all its miserable torture, is no proof of pride or egotism in its subject. It simply proves the sharp power with which a subconscious occupation with his reflection in others possesses him. It is that he has extraordinary sympathy, not extraordinary selfishness. But it is, unfortunately, a viscid and attached, not a sparkling and free sympathy and it is one of the most fatal barriers to surrender, fusion, and joy in company. The Solitude of Love Very different from the forlorn retirement of grief, but sometimes almost as exclusive in its kind, is the solitude of love. That contrasts with this as the loneliness of the closet with the loneliness of the grove. There is the oppression of an imprisoning limit here, the freedom of a bounding impulse, but in both alike, an isolating quality, a consecrating intensity, an insuperable repugnance to the indiscriminate intercourse of the world. In both, when at their height, the desire to be alone is so keen that the subject of the experience feels the presence of a single person to be equivalent to the presence of a multitude. Then, as Ovid said, Shall I whisper aloud that we too make a crowd? With all unwontedly earnest, love mingles an obscure foreboding of wreck and loss, bereavement and agony to come. On its upper surface, affection admits acquaintances to see their smiles and to hear their words re-echoed. But in this lower deep, where the wonderful omens move, it excludes curiosity and even sympathy and broods alone with its unshareable bliss or its strange presentiments of ill. Whether so rich a boon is felt to be unsuited to the conditions of earth, too fair to last, sure to provoke some envious power to blast it, I know not. But truly so it is that the finer any experience of love becomes in our human relations, the more surely it is haunted by a formless fear, dispensing where it prevails an air of solitude, a lonesome misgiving, like that derived from the undefined fate which fills the background of a Greek tragedy. There is a bitter loneliness resulting from the absence and need of love, as well as a sweet loneliness resulting from the presence of it. Few have felt this more sharply than Charlotte Bronte, and she has described it. Sometimes when I wake in the morning, and know that solitude, remembrance, and longing are to be almost my sole companions all day through, that at night I shall go to bed with them, that they will long keep me sleepless, that next morning I shall wake to them again, I have a heavy heart of it. Charles Lamb, the exquisite affectionateness of whose nature 
with his poverty and many bitter trials, made him especially susceptible of such an experience, shows us a glimpse of his sufferings from it in the poem he addressed to his friend Lloyd, when the latter sought him out in London, alone, obscure, without a friend, a cheerless, solitary thing. He says, For this a gleam of random joy hath flushed my unaccustomed cheek, and with an o'ercharged bursting heart I feel the thoughts I cannot speak. O oh, sweet are all the muses lays, and sweet the charm of mate and bird. T'was long since these estranged ears the sweeter voice of friend had heard. George MacDonald, referring to an English traveler among the Swiss mountains, who snobbishly regarded all but himself as intruders, well says, Was there not plenty of room upon those wastes for him and them? Love will provide a solitude in the crowd, and dislike will fill the desert itself with unpleasant forms. Jesus is the supreme example of that loneliness which is felt as a consequence of the greatness of the love within and the smallness of the love without. The foxes, he sighed, have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And when the Pharisee at whose table he dined complained of the toleration he showed for the sinful woman, what a world of lonely and sorrowing tenderness is unveiled in his reply. Simon, thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman hath not ceased to kiss my feet. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. Vivid and profound love shrinks from communicating its confidences, lest injury be done them, lest their hollowedness be profaned. Their delicacy is too ethereal for a rough hand. Their vestal bloom is too holy for unconsecrated spectators. Grief in its soreness allows only the tender themes that are wanted and soothing to touch its hurt fibers. Love in its scrupulous sacredness permits only the trusted and adored object to come near and read its confessions. The priest alone can be admitted to the shrine. The dedicated privacy of a pure and modest heart cannot expose its shaded secrets to vulgar lookers. The more pertinaciously they explore, the more bashfully it shrinks and veils. It can calmly brook no eye save that of God and the elected one. Therefore, around this most choice and sensitive experience, there ever spreads a kind of solitude. It is true that the experience resulting from an access of fervent affection often has another aspect. Its expansiveness makes it many times seem emphatically social. The heart, enlarged by its new sympathy with one, grows bountiful to all. Nevertheless, the face of the experience here insisted on is true too. Love affects not the dusty highway, but the woodland path. It retires to brood over its thick clustering and honeyed thoughts. The maiden with the picture of her lover runs not into the crowd to gaze on it, but wanders into some umbrageous nook where imagination may feed on itself, nor fear rebuke from the ring dove balancing on yonder bow or betrayal from that brook the babbling tongue of the glen. Solitude is not only the sanctuary, it is also the nursery of sentiment where, brooding over itself in quiet and sympathetically brooding over whatsoever is friendly to it, it grows deeper and draws around itself an ever-enlarging mass of nutritious associations. Petrarch, the High Laureate of this feeling, sings, From hill to hill I roam, from thought to thought, with love my guide, the beaten path I fly. For there in vain the tranquil life is sought, if mid the waste well forth a lonely rill, or deep embosomed a low valley lie. In its calm shade my trembling heart is still, and there, if love so will, I smile or weep or fondly hope or fear. That which is true of sentiment in general is true of a just and genuine piety in particular. It is the shallow that is garrulous, the deep is silent. The name of Christ, the idea of deity, the sense of eternity, the anticipation of heaven, the mysteries of sin and regeneration are things too solemn and sublime to be bandied from mouth to mouth in technical debates and conventional conferences. Cleaving to the marrow of life, to the dividing asunder of spirit and flesh, 
They fitly appropriate to themselves the most select and awful moments of meditation, the most secret and sanctified moods of affection. When not a taint of passion befouls the heart, and the fewest vestiges of earth linger on the mind. Few persons have genius and soul enough to experience the highest religious emotions at first hand. The most can but poorly simulate and echo them, or copy their forms and attitudes at a distance. Thus the gigantic personalities in, whom, in whose tremendous powers and passions the chief religious experiences and rites now current first originated, comes to be reproduced in dwarfed proportions and faded hues, as though the motions of a figure whose colossal bulk filled the space between earth and heaven were seen reflected in diminishing mirrors as the posturings of a puppet. To mirror livingly and originally the transcendent realities and relations from whose correspondences in consciousness the primal religious emotions are born, requires a depth and translucency of sensibility not possessed by one man out of a million. The mighty objects and truths which create religion by surpassing and baffling our powers which engender in our ignorance and weakness the dread sense of dependence, wander and aspiration, refuse to reflect themselves in the shallow and turbid pools which poorer souls furnish. Religion, therefore, is essentially lonely and not social. The common notion, to the contrary, is a vulgar fallacy, a fallacy, however, almost unavoidable from the intimate association of sociality with religious phenomena. The true and pure religious emotions are essentially solitary, and love only loneliness. But the awe, mystery, helplessness connected with them terrify us and force us to seek fellowship in our experience of them as a relief and reassurance. It will always be found that for the exercise of their ultimate religious feelings, the highest, greatest, deepest souls irresistibly seek solitude, unspeakably enjoy it, and shrink from society at such times with insuperable repugnance. But to the multitude, the direct and solitary contemplation of their relations with the unknown and the infinite is too awful. It must be shared, diluted, relieved by organic fellowships and poetic associations. There are topics appropriate for speech which naturally find utterance in address or conversation. There are other topics, meet but for private contemplation and ordering, which find fit expression only in soliloquy. This subject has been treated with admirable precision and grace in two discourses on the sphere of silence by an English divine. They are to be found in that series of wonderful discourses by James Martineau entitled Endeavors After the Christian Life. The naked rarities of religion dwell in the last penetralia of our being where no mortal communion can reach. The knowledge and love of them must ever be a recluse experience because their grandeur is so great as to monopolize the attention it secures and because their modesty is such that they die away at the first proposal of exhibition or flattery. They will bestow their fellowship and reveal their forms in the dark mirror of the mental holy of holies, only when every wind of the world is whist, and a silence, as of the primordial solitude, reigns throughout the spaces of the soul. For experiences celestially fine and sensitive as these, public comparison, giddy talk, any sort of notoriety, is desecration. To strew pearls before the unclean who will turn and rend you for it is an outrage on all that is fit. Those of swinish character, having no taste for adorning themselves but only agreed for coarse food, must be expected to turn angrily on the inconsiderate man who disappoints with indigestible jewelry their appetite for corn. A drunkard disparaging or eulogizing temperance a harlot discanting on the nature of virtue, or an epicure discussing the worth of denial and heroism is an odious spectacle. The highest instincts of the soul demand moral congruity. Who could endure to pour the weird strains of Mendelssohn's dream amidst the rattling of the square and the mart? Who would not rather hide the pictures of Perugino forever than display them on the walls of a slaughterhouse? 
There were pure and holy women who never exposed their charms or shared their delights with the world, as there are lakes that on the untrodden tops of mountains, like eyes of the earth, look only up to heaven. There is a suitableness of person, of scene, and season required for the unveiling of the secrets and the contemplation of the treasures of affection. Refined and thoughtful must be the person, not harsh and reckless. The scene and season not obtrusive and noisy, but retired and still. Whatever reeks and roars with the rushing world, shocks and defiles. Pure and pensive solitude is the setting that woos the living pictures. Nor is there any one wholly destitute of this lonely companionship of love, this saddening wealth of joy. The veriest wretch in the world has some dear memory, some beautiful longing, some guarded ideal so fondly prized that he loves to set apart secret moments for pilgrimages to its inner sanctuary, there to worship, perhaps to weep, where no eye can see and no ear can hear. So even the most superficial votary of fashion, the most inconsiderate retailer of petty scandals, has her times of uncompanionable reflection, unfathomable emotion and desire. Occasionally this is found to be true in cases where it would have been least suspected, so carefully had it been concealed. Reckless critics often make the cruelest misjudgments here. Not unfrequently, those thirsting most for love shrink most from notice. Obscurity is their shield. What can be so melancholy as to have sacred experiences which ache for expression and sympathy and not dare to expose them for fear of repulse or ridicule? It is more melancholy not to have them. The glorious, sad solitude of one devoted to the highest ends who can find no comrades who roams the streets at night, weeping, longing for someone to walk and talk with him, to aspire and work with him, is more to be admired than to be pitied. The weeping is indeed a weakness, but it expresses a strength. To call such a one an egoist or a sentimental fool, to laugh or sneer at his pain, is a wicked heartlessness, however often it is done. The wealth of a soul is measured by how much it can feel, its poverty by how little. God hands gifts to some, whispers them to others. In the former, the divine charm is followed by immediate popular recognition. In the latter, it is usually hidden for a long time from all except the deep-souled and deep-seeing few. It is not improbable that the truest saints have never been heard of too divinely great for fame to solely them with state. They have modestly offered themselves up to the universal in seclusion and silence. There is an hour, the transition between day and night, celebrated by the poets with Dante at their head, which fine souls in all ages have felt as the votive season of sentiment. Pensive twilight, the dim-tinted habitation of solitude and sacredness, hailed with mountain horns of hymns, bells, and prayers, while nature herself, half steeped in roseate hues, half mantled in shadow, seems to be tenderly musing. Soft hour which wakes the wish and melts the heart of those who sail the seas on the first day, when they from their sweet friends are torn apart, or fills with love the pilgrim on his way, as the far bell of Vesper makes him start, seeming to weep the dying day's decay. It is the favorite hour of all poetic lovers who have ever consecrated it to their beloved. Love they what they may, when they retreat by themselves from the thick solitudes called social, to indulge and nourish their master sentiment. When sensitive genius keeps tryst with its idolized ideal, the betrothed keep tryst together, and saints keep tryst with the spirit of devotion and their God. The Solitude of Genius Almost every great man addicted to contemplation and of literary habit has left on record some expression of his loneliness. Erasmus, while residing in the University of Cambridge as a lecturer on Greek and theology, writes to his friend Ammonius, under date November 28, 
1515. Here is one unbroken solitude. Many have left for fear of the plague, and yet when they are all here, the solitude is much worse. Shakespeare, whose unparalleled sensitiveness and vastness of sensibility seems to have enabled him to embrace the conscious substance of almost every form of experience ever presented to man, who has so livingly painted the imaginative solitude of Prospero, in one of his sonnets speaks in his own person of a time, when in disgrace with fortune and men's eyes, I all alone beweep my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries. Blessing, after the death of his wife, wrote to Claudius, I must begin once more to go on my way alone. I have not a single friend to whom I can confide my whole being. I am too proud to own that I am unhappy. I shut my teeth and let the bark drift. Enough that I do not turn it over with my own hands. The separate conditions of mental loneliness are joined and concentrated in the case of genius. A personality exceptionally emphasized, sensibility chronically as exquisite as that of others is temporarily made by bereaving afflictions or blissful boons, an absorbing activity in the line of its special vocation. All these belong to genius, and therefore it must be largely solitary. Genius is average humanity raised to a higher power and is distinguished from its neighbors as the king is distinguished from his courtiers by the dais and the crown. Every great passion, sublime purpose, singular pursuit, or unequaled susceptibility naturally tends to isolate its subject and make him pine with baffled longings. Furthermore, the fact that genius, by its realizing imagination and appropriating sympathy, naturally shares in all the events and experiences of which the signs are brought to its knowledge, as keenly as the ordinary soul feels its own personal concerns, makes it liable to extreme distress in the wrongs and woes of the world. Hence often arises a strong temptation to retreat into some remote solitude to escape the harassing pressure of this ideal contact with the great miseries of the public battle of life. Cowper expresses the feeling well. Oh, for a lodge in some vast wilderness, some boundless contiguity of shade, where rumor of oppression and deceit, of unsuccessful or successful war, might never reach me more. My ear is pained, my soul is sick with every day's report of wrong and outrage with which earth is filled. There are, concealed in the undesecrate shrine of innocence, a thousand matters too modest and too holy to suffer themselves to be laid bare to the gaze of hardened men. There are, in and about the virgin soul of genius, a thousand delicious fragilities of thought and sentiment, which, like the dewy gossamer shown on a rose bush at sunrise, if you try to lift and convey them, are torn, dissolve, and vanish from your grasp. Such a soul must crave seclusion from the jar and friction of life, sweet opportunities for musing and aspiration. Quiet is the element of wisdom, the calmest man is the wisest. Some persons are so crude and heavy that it requires ponderous masses of power to disturb the stolid poise of their attractions. Others are as alive to imponderable influences as electrometers. Between such a great gulf is fixed. A fine interior nature, exuberant with affection and fancy, set in a world of capricious external hurriers, frigid mockers, ever eluding his embrace, is as lonely as an alpine flower nestled in the crevice of a crag and blooming there on the edge of the glacier. The man whose heart is such a sensitive plant that every cloud which floats remotely above it causes its petals to close what adequate communion can he have with the herds of jokers, the noise of whose mirth intrudes on the silence of his prayers? He feels more at home on the margin of a lonely stream than in the thoroughness of the metropolis. 
the bell of a sequestered convent is much more congenial to him than the hum of a reception room. No wonder rich and delicate natures protect themselves by retreating. They suffer less cruelly from their melancholy desertedness than from the lacerations of ungenial society. An awkward coarse companion disturbs the reveries that hang in live suspense on the altitudes of their minds, as rudely as when, floating in a canoe at midnight on a forest-girt pond, the idiotic laugh of the loon suddenly breaks the spell, dispersing the solemn hush of wood and lake. It is natural enough that after such an experience, loneliness should be, for a while, preferred to company. Solitude is the refuge of the sensitive. It is a necessity for genius to feel, in a certain sense, a complacent aloofness and superiority to the herd of the world in order to sustain itself at its own proper height. Among the 200,000 men who rose up when Virgil entered the Roman theater, there was but one various competent to correct the Aenid. Knowing the thoughtlessness and fickleness of the folly swayed mass of the people, if the great man did not cherish a keen conviction of his own greater elevation, insight, and nobleness, he would soon cease to be a great man. Thus, Goethe wrote in his old age, I was first uncomfortable to men by my error, then by earnestness. So, do what I would, I was alone. So Adam Smith said, The mob of mankind are admirers and worshippers of wealth and station. So Bishop Butler said, Whole communities may be insane as well as individuals. So Spinoza, pitching his tent as on an Ararat in the desert of disdain from the incomparable loftiness and scope of his intellectual horizon, looked down on the undiscriminating and incompetent multitudes of men with a quiet and pitying contempt. This was full of solace and strength for him. Without it, he would have died of heartbreak and despair. His distance from the groveling victims of ignorance, delusion, and hate measured his nearness to God, and he was supported. There was no unkindness in his mood. It is removed by a whole moral world from everything like vindictive spleen. Madame Switchine was very free from pride and the spirit of contempt, yet she writes from Paris to a friend, My God, the pitiable thing the conversation of these assemblies is. It was the first of the year. Nonsense, silliness, gossip, frivolity were all in their freshness. It is indeed well to repose through the summer, away from what is called the grand world, a taste for which is the greatest misfortune that can happen to mind and heart. A complacent reaction from the vices and pettiness of the crowd upon the superior nobleness of their own loyalty, powers, and pursuits is the unfailing internal support of the truly great. God forbid that the highest should hate or insult the lowest, and it is not their true nature to do so. They yearn pityingly over their farthest inferiors. Yet it is vain to attempt to hide the prodigious disparity between them. And when those beneath force this disparity on the notice of those above, by assuming superiority, it is not to be wondered at if the latter experience a shock of revulsion. The accusers of Socrates arrogated to themselves a higher virtue and wisdom than his. Undoubtedly, his consciousness of the relative moral height between them and himself was a godlike consolation to him. The sublime courage and calmness with which he claimed from his judges, instead of death, a support by the city as a public benefactor, show that he was perfectly aware of the immense moral distance between Socrates and Anitus, Miletus, and Lycon. In every case of martyrdom, perhaps the cruelest feature is the self-assumed superiority implied by the judges in the very fact of condemning their victim. His greatest support, on the contrary, must come from the convictions of their injustice in putting him to death, and of his own worth in standing loyally by his duty. There is a surpassing heroism. There must be a deep pain 
and there certainly is a terrible loneliness in singly confronting, as so many noble men have done, an infuriated mob to stem its wrath, stay its folly, avert its vengeance, even at the cost of falling a prey to its headless and horrid passion. Who can dwell on such an example without a pang of pity and a thrill of grateful admiration? When we think of Alexander Hamilton, booted and stoned in the streets of New York, and what relief his beautiful form stands out against the howling mass of ignorance and ferocity below, but should we undertake to make a list of the wronged and hated benefactors of the world, the exiled or martyred guides and exemplars of our race up to the crucifixion of the Savior, there would be no end to the tearful tale. The crowning moral of the narrative would be the inspired sentiment sighed from the summit of Calvary. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But since man was made for society, it is not good for him no matter how great he is, to be always alone. If he's doomed to be so, his lot must be full of sad wishes. There are wounds the world cannot balm, once no outer success can satisfy, though to poor and cold natures these sharpest of griefs are never known. It is the soft-hearted who are heavy-hearted. The loftiest mind may shelter the most, but it must be the least sheltered. There is no desertion like that of a soul sublimely incongruous with its mates and with the conditions of its time and place. The choicest hearts are the ones most likely to know the experiences of disappointment and cruelty in all their wasting bitterness. Such hearts there are which, once misunderstood and aggrieved, never dare to confide again. In the mournful isolatedness of their balked yet unappeasable longings, well may they exclaim, Come, death, and match thy quiet bloom with beings darkling strife. Come, set beside the lonely tomb the solitude of life. Generally speaking, the man of genius is a lonely man, not only from the greatness of his endowments, the height at which he lives, and the absorbing action of his faculties, but also from his scorn of conventionalities. Sneers at conventionality, sneers rising from failure to see its inevitableness and use, are cheap. Conventionality is the unavoidable expression of social averages. But it must be naturally irksome to the man of genius who belongs outside of the average. How can he be otherwise than solitary when he sits on the great white throne of imagination, gazing at the panoramic phenomena of the creation in the light of transcendental philosophies, till from before his face earth and heaven flee away and no place is found for them. Impatient of custom, contemptuous of fashionable decrees, he must frequently be a banished man. The epicures, the butterflies, the selfish plotters, and all such cannot understand him, and to be mentally baffled is painful. He sets an example they cannot follow, and to feel inferiority is painful. His ideas and beliefs are strange to them, apparently inconsistent with the familiar ideas and beliefs with which they identify their welfare, perhaps their salvation, and what is unintelligible and is supposed dangerous is feared. Accordingly, they desire to rid themselves of his presence. The great man acts from spontaneity. Society acts from habit and is intolerant of original action because it makes such exorbitant demands. To act conventionally costs little. To act from fresh impulse requires a large supply of power. Fashion always aims to live with the least expenditure of force. Genius is always seeking outlets for its overflowing force. Consequently, luxurious society is the natural enemy of genius and, as far as it can, exiles it into solitude. The most ignoble men, still more than average men, hate the superiors whom they are unable to appreciate. Their thwarted mental reactions generate spite and wrath. The treatment of great men by the world in all ages exemplifies the mysterious law of vicarious redemption, confirms the words which Jesus spoke out of his own experience. 
Behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them ye shall scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. A majority of the noblest geniuses who have conferred the greatest benefits of mankind on mankind have been spit upon or gnashed at and banned by the dominant class of their contemporaries. Prophets, discoverers, inventors, martyrs, illustrious company gathered from many times and countries and associated in one fellowship of sublime genius, heroic devotion, and tragic fate. History has nothing left of equal pathos to reveal when it has shown us these men, dreaded, despised, persecuted, outcast, dying, appealing to, after generations, to do them the justice so cruelly denied in their own. Nor has posterity proved recreant to the Holy Trust. They are revered and celebrated now with an enthusiasm in strange contrast with the obloquy they suffered when alive. And to enter into sympathy with them is an inexpressible comfort to those who in later times are called to a kindred experience. As Hein says, an equally great man sees his predecessors far more significantly than others can. From a single spark of the traces of their earthly glory, he recognizes their most secret act. From a single word left behind, he penetrates every fold of their hearts. And thus, the great men of all times live in a mystical brotherhood. Across long centuries, they bow to each other and gaze on each other with significant glances, and their eyes meet over the graves of buried races whom they have thrust aside between, and they understand and love each other. The picture in the New Testament of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration in converse with Moses and Elias is a beautiful symbol of the fellowship of the highest kindred spirits in all ages. The consciousness of thinking and feeling in unison with the multitude of believing doctrines and observing rites in common with the great majority of our brethren yields to sympathetic genius an invisible peace-giving fellowship which causes an indescribable pleasantness to breathe in the air, an infinite friendliness to saturate the landscape, to abandon all the dear familiar beliefs and associations in which one grew up in allegiance to reason, to go exploringly forwards into the obscure future, to find some better substitutes, more divinely real and solid, is to be, at least temporarily, like one who advances into a cave in a mountainside. The sight of the green fields, the light of the sun, the sound of the waterfall, the bleat of the goats, and the songs of the herdsmen, all becoming fainter and fainter until he's lost in darkness and silence. It is impossible that severe pangs should not be involved when conscious sternly orders a sensitive and clinging soul to renounce prevalent creeds, to cast off current prejudices and usages, to leave popular favor, estranged behind, and accept newly revealed and persecuted truth with its austere duties. It is to undergo a coronation of hate and agony, and, carrying a crucifix within the bosom, journey on a lonesome way of dollar, publicly shrouded in scorn, secretly transfigured with the smile of God. The loneliest of all mortals are the pioneers of new principles and policies, new faiths and feelings, for they alone have none on earth with whom they can hold brotherhood of soul. Having emerged from the beliefs in which they were educated, thrown away habituated reliances, Trusting themselves to original perception as they advance into the unknown, out of which new revelations are breaking on them. Their solitude is sometimes as appalling as the experience of one who for the first time rides on a locomotive across a midnight prairie, where, through the level gloom, he seems just plunging off the world into banks of stars. The bigotry of those whose opinions he rejected has succeeded in attaching an unjust odium to the name of David Hume, who was a man of remarkable goodness of heart and life. He was endowed with a mind of wonderful acuteness and strength, exceedingly suggestive and stimulative in its working on other minds. His place in the history of philosophy is of epochal importance. 
Kant ascribes his own original work of such immense moment to the impulse directly imparted to him by Hume. One of the results of his unsettling inquiries, his idealistic speculations, has been thus impressively depicted by himself. I am affrighted and confounded with that forlorn solitude in which I am placed in my philosophy and fancy myself some strange, uncouth monster who, not being able to mingle and unite in society, has been expelled all human commerce and left utterly abandoned and disconsolate. Fairn would I run into the crowd for shelter and warmth, but I cannot prevail with myself to mix with such deformity. I call upon others to join me in order to make a company apart, but no one will hearken to me. Everyone keeps at a distance and dreads that storm which beats upon me from every side. I have exposed myself to the enmity of all metaphysicians, logicians, mathematicians, and even theologians. And can I wonder at the insults I must suffer? When I look abroad, I foresee on every side dispute, contradiction, anger, calumny, and detraction. When I turn my eye inward, I find nothing but doubt and ignorance. All the world conspires to oppose and contradict me, though such is my weakness that I feel all my opinions loosen and fall of themselves when unsupported by the approbation of others. What other experience can be so forsaken and grand as the loneliness of the man who has outgrown the opinion of his age, surveyed all the realms of knowledge and theory thus far achieved, traversed the constellated wastes of spiritual space, the outermost verge of thought, where he confronts the scintillating abyss of mystery, leaves contemporary humanity behind, pitches his tent a hundred leagues ahead of his nearest peer, and lives there, striving to conquer fresh realms for the occupation of posterity. He may be happy even in that forlorn station, if he preserves a noble heart of kindness to his kind, and a spirit of self-surrendering trust in God. Such a man needs not recognition by official diplomas. Load him with conventional honors, he would lay the trinkets aside and retire into himself to commune with his true dignity. He is an emperor, himself his empire. He will not forget the dependence of feebler natures, nor cease to yearn over them in their wants and sorrows. Though isolated from the people by his intellectual transcendency, he will be joined with them by his affections and services, as the snow-capped summit of Dwalagiri commerces with the sky in inaccessible solitude, while his gushing streams and his slopes of bloom wed him with the plains. Should the lofty thinker lose his confidence in reason and truth and give way to a fundamental distrust, as the tendencies are often so terrible in him to do, becoming a misanthrope and an atheist, his experience may be compared with the fate of that aeronaut who ascended into the congealing space until he suffocated from the thinness of the air, and his frozen form, born in the fragile car, floated about at the will of the atmospheric currents in the cold, unsounding vastitude. Under the dark sky vault, the earth shrunk into a great ball below. We cannot always live in public. There are secrets and moments we can never share. We should be familiar with the necessity and make it grateful. We should cultivate in thought its serene, contentful aspects and guard against its oppressive, fearful aspects. Who is it that sits on the world as lightly as a goal on the ocean, except he who has learned by solitary thought to detach his affections from the prides and vanities of society and often to lose himself in the fruition of a transcendent faith. To be separated by ascetic superstition is to know the loneliness of Arsenius, who, after being tutor to the emperor Arcadius, went into the desert and for fifty years made his life one long solitary prayer. To be separated by the remorseful memory of crime is to know the loneliness of Milo, when caught by the fingers in the rebounding oak he would split and left as a prey to the wild beasts. To be separated by absorption in some sweet care is to know the loneliness of Isaac Walton trouting in a secluded glen. 
To the guilty and debased soul, there may come a loneliness like the solitude of a volcanic peak full of boiling lava and smoke. But to the virtuous and trustful soul, there may come a loneliness like the solitude of a spring in the desert, where all night long the wild children of nature successively slake their thirst. The fawn and the panther, the lion and the elephant, and the moon comes there, sees her fair face, and departs smiling.